Good Hi, evening, everybody. everyone. Good evening and uh, welcome to WAW, the show where important topics of the day are largely ignored. And foolishness reigns supreme, and it always does. Yep, and we're here to uh, ask the eternal question. What's, What's happening? happening? Well, there's a lot happening, actually. There's a lot happening. <laughs> Melinda, Marsha, Larry, Jim. Henry, Henry and Martha. Hi, guys. Hey, Jim. Hi, Larry. Hi, Marcy. Hi, Melinda. Sorry, Marcy. I called you Marsha. I'm sorry. She can't see. I can't guys. see. I, I actually has, have uh, my glasses right here, but I'm not wearing them. So if I, if I like call just people hi, random names, if it sounds yeah. like it may be your name, it probably is. So, <laughs> hi, hi, Brenna. Thank you for joining us. Uh, welcome. Welcome to WAW. Wow. Yeah. Uh, Wednesday night. We had a, a pretty exciting weekend. Oh, man. It was a pretty, it was, it was a whirlwind, crazy, but it was fun. Oh man, yeah, it's it's been, I you know, I think <laughs> since Friday of last week, everything has kind of been like a blur for a me. whole blur, a right? whole blur, but but it, but a fun blur because we went to San Francisco. Hey Chris, with our friends Hi, and bandmates, Hi, Eileen. Swan Hi, Montgomery and Elena Montgomery. Yeah, uh, we went to San Francisco and we had no shows. We actually, it was a vacation. Hi, yeah, yeah. It was a vacation. It was, uh, it was it was a lot of fun. I mean, it was extremely exhausting. But uh, you know, exhausting can be fun sometimes. No, it's exhausting is fun. <laughs> so we we went to um, what did we do? Alcatraz. Yeah. We did um, Ghirardelli. Ghirardelli's, which is the most. We important. rode scooters. We went to Haight Ashbury. We went to Haight Ashbury, and so we had a little hiccup on. On Haight Ashbury, so wanna, I did. I did actually did not post about this, you but go there. Yeah, I'm gonna go there because I just uh, spent the entire day on the phone with a claims adjuster. Hi, Kathy. Um, AAA. So while we were touring the street, someone broke into our car and they stole my purse yeah. with my wallet with mm -hmm. my cash, yeah. but I had my credit cards, I had my driver's license, I had some of my cash, <clears throat> some of my cash was in the car. Mm -hmm. um, hey, Rick. My earbuds, uh, anyway, we, we had theft, but we found out when we were at the police station that six other vehicles had also been broken into within that hour period. That's so correct. it's a ring. I mean, they, they uh, unfortunately, our rental car, we found out later, yeah. even though you locked it, the hatch did not lock. And we found that out later. So we put in a claim to the rental car company. And then I called our home insurance and put in a claim with our home insurance. Yeah. Hi, um, Cindy. So hopefully I, I oh, but you know, the, hey, the, the worst part about this whole thing is I didn't care about the, Five thousand dollars worth of makeup didn't bother me. Wait, what? It was a lot. Not five thousand, but I'm just oh, I'm I'm just pulling it out of proportion. Um, I wouldn't. Uh, we I had a lot of makeup, a and I and I like expensive makeup, as you can tell. This is not what I look like in the morning. <laughs> <laughs> oh, don't let her tell you that. Of course you do. Um, hey, by the way, guys, she was busting my chops about my uh, shirt. Is my shirt okay? Does everybody like my shirt? Does it, do I look like I'm slumming it today? Well, the thing is, he bought these beautiful shirts on Hate and Ashbury, these gorgeous <laughs> shirts. And I'm like, wear one of your beautiful shirts, not one of your sweatshirts. I'm wearing the I'm wearing, this is what you I'm wearing wear the bonds. beautiful shirt on Sunday for the Pure Bread show. All right. So hi Dolly. Anyway, so I, I, I had us. my hi, but I think the thing that hurt me the most is not the cash, not yeah. the credit cards yeah. that were stolen. Not even the gift cards that were stolen, not even mm -hmm. my expensive makeup. Right. It was my flag leather purse. I had this beautiful yeah. purse that I had purchased yeah. from San That's Manuel right. merch store at uh in San Manuel. Um I had paid about two hundred and fifty dollars for this purse. Yeah, which she didn't tell me at I the didn't. time. <laughs> Hi Jean. <laughs> Hi Jean. What? <laughs> okay. <laughs> Um, okay, but anyway, yeah, we, but we had a theft. She's not telling the most exciting part here, guys. Okay, so we after all this happened, um, oh, 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 somebody yeah, yeah, yeah. From, from across yeah, the street came right. up to our car and said, Hey, guys, just wanted to let you know we got pictures of the cars, uh, the people that broke into your vehicle. And we're like, Wait, broke into our vehicle? 
There's no broken glass or anything. So they actually got pictures of the people stealing stuff from our vehicle. But not of the people themselves, of the, of, of the, the, vehicle. Car, the vehicle. So we went to the police department. We made a report. Uh -huh. We gave them the plate number. But the, the police department did say that odds are the plate that's on the vehicle is not yeah. the plate that belongs to the car. That's right. Which is very common because it's a ring that does this. Yeah. There's um, David. Uh, and so, and so Bob, Jim and Swan, as Elena and I are just are making a police report at the San Francisco Police Department about my purse that had been stolen. Hi, Elena. Hi, Jim Tommy. and Swan decide to jump into the vehicle <laughs> and go back to Haight and Ashbury and to see if they can find the car. And we found it, guys. And they found we the car. We found the car. Yes, they did. It was coming yes, the, uh, the opposite direction. It's coming this way. And I, I look over and I, I point. Swan's like, what? So the car passes us yep, yep. and he saw our vehicle. Yep. We spun around in the middle of the street, went after him. He he made an illegal left turn and we got caught at the light. Yep. And we, yep. We I mean, okay, here's him. a question. Hey, Elena just joined us. So so what would you have done had you had you had you caught the vehicle? Would you have pulled them out of the car and beat them to a pulp in the middle of 8th Street? That, that kind of crossed our minds. I mean, I would have. I'm telling you yeah. right now, <laughs> Elena and I, I know Elena and I, and Elena and I, had we caught those people, because my mom's my Facebook yeah, friend. Yeah. Keep, keep that clean. <laughs> keep it clean. We would have uh, yanked their butts out of the car and probably would've. beat them, unless they had guns. Well, that that's was unless kind of they what, had that's guns. what, what uh, was kind of on our mind. We kind of went into Starsky and Hutch mode. And, you but know. I'm telling you, the police, the San Francisco Police Department actually said, even if they catch someone I in the it. act hey, of Swan. breaking into a car. <laughs> Look what Swan said. What are you saying? Swan. Kicked his ass. <laughs> Absolutely. Right. Swan. Swan would have kicked his ass. He would have done it. But here's what, the, here's what the policemen said at the San Francisco Police Department. They said, had they caught someone in the act and they run, yeah. they cannot chase them. No, that's true. That's so true. these... People, yeah. my mom's my Facebook friend. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Know that. So this is what they do. Well, so, yeah, and Elena has a good point. She's all you what? Especially when the, when the cops say they carry guns. I know. You know, that know. would have been a little bit of a deterrent for us. But, <laughs> but the funny part is Swan and Jim actually yeah. found these oh man people. It, it, my mom's I know. What my are the Facebook odds of that? <laughs> That was hilarious. Anyway, mm. so we made a claim. I was on the phone all day today making a claim with the rental company, the insurance company. Um, so hopefully the only thing I cared about was my leather flag purse. That's the only thing I cared about. I didn't care about my money. Is that or, what you care or about? Or my $5,000 worth of makeup. <laughs> uh, all right. Well, let's yeah. talk about, uh, yes, yes. I know they do carry guns. Hey, and Ginger they Puppy do just carry joined guns. us. Ginger Puppy just joined us. Who? Ginger Puppy. Who's Ginger Puppy? That's uh, Johnny Lust Dog. Oh. Hey, John. Johnny Lust Dog has How you a doing, Facebook brother? page. Apparently so. Oh, okay. All right. Well, let's talk about wait, wait. Uh, let's talk about our our stuff real fast because we're going to get to our oh, wait, very we had special a comment. guest. We had a comment. All right. There what's our that, guest? What's uh, comment? At the end there. Um, All right. Eric says, Coach House, September third, great show. Yeah. Bailey Up Tavern, September twenty fifth, great show. Do I make it a hat trick with the Temecula show Saturday? Absolutely, yeah, Eric. Totally we're going to be do doing uh, yes. This Saturday night at um, Old Town Temecula Community Theater. It's a two not. It's a two header. Well, yeah, Friday night is going to be the long run. Um, uh, experience the Eagles. And that's Friday night, and I believe it may be sold out. You may want to check on that. Uh, I'm not sure the status of Led Zepp again, but Led Zepp again on Saturday is uh, going to be doing um, the entire Song Remains the Same album, uh, the whole soundtrack. And there's going to be visuals and really cool lighting and everything. It's going to end uh, low, low uh, laying fog for no quarter. So it's going to be a great night. Hope you can all join us. Is uh, the fog machine going to be working on no quarter? It is. Ooh, that's yeah, good. it's going to be great. That's exciting. And then on Sunday, <laughs> uh, Sunday afternoon, um, we're going to be playing with Pure Bread. Uh, a tribute to bread, um, Ray Kokel and I, and uh, Dave Stretch, yeah. Dan Avance, and Johnny Z is going to be sitting in with us. We're going to be playing at the Coffee Gallery in Altadena at 2 p.m. And then at 6 p.m., 
I'm going to uh, just go grab a bite to eat in between. And then um, uh, we're going to be playing with Taylor Made Tapestry, doing all the greatest hits James of Taylor. James Taylor and Carol King. Which so is one of my very favorites. We hope James that Taylor. you guys can join us. Yeah, you can call the coffee gallery backstage and, and make reservations. Uh, it only holds 50 people. So um, it's a small it's a small yeah. space, but it's very intimate and it's very nice. Yeah, it's yeah. it's it's a great yeah. afternoon. Yeah. And if, if you'd All like right. To join and us. Uh, let's let's just hit my cups real fast. If you guys want a personalized cup, please. I, I have a website now, which is blondiecollection.com. Order today. My cutoff date for holiday orders is November 15th. So. Unfortunately, I have to cut off at November 15th so I can get your cups to you by December 1st for holiday order. So be, be sure and order your cups by then. You have an entire month. And then we're going to talk about Calvin, our our friend Calvin, Calvin's Auto Works at 501 East That's Blue right. Boulevard. If you mention WAW, you get 10% off. It's a good deal. And we love Calvin because yeah. Calvin is the kind of mechanic that actually says, you don't need to fix this now, but in two months, you're going to need this to happen. Yeah. You kind of so makes you aware of what, what uh, needs to happen maintenance-wise right. with your vehicle. It's the best mechanic ever. Because yeah. we, we spent 20 years pretty much being spanked yeah. oh, by yeah, every absolutely. mechanic we've ever Absolutely. Had. And uh, Yeah. So <laughs> if, you want a, uh, if you want a good, honest mechanic, how, how often do you ever hear those two words in the same sentence? You don't hear good, honest, sentence? and mechanic all in the same sentence. If they're good, they're usually not honest. <laughs> and if they're honest, they're usually not good. Yeah. <laughs> so Calvin's, Calvin's Auto Repair at 501 East Glen Oaks Boulevard. He's amazing. He's yeah. amazing. And um, uh, if you mention WAW, you will get 10% 10 off, off of your bill, which we forgot to do. Uh, we, didn't even that, we didn't even mention it the that, last time. That, we would actually our, went in. that would have paid for our lunch. <laughs> You know what? I mean? That's right. You got to remind me next time. That's right. Okay. All right. Well, we have a very special oh, guest yeah. tonight. Oh yeah, we got a great a, guest for a you long tonight, time guys. friend of Jim. Yes. We were just oh, talking man. about this. How long? Yes. I had no idea we're how long. Like forty years, probably. I didn't know yeah, you had known Ron for forty, to 40 years. years. I I thought you only had kind of met him with the Fab Four, but you knew him before well, the Fab Four. Briefly, I mean, we 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 met uh, briefly early on there, but um, uh, after I stopped playing for a while there. Um, he actually recruited uh, Rolo, my good friend and, and high, school um, friend. high school mate. Yeah. Uh, we graduated together and um, uh, they got the Fab Four started. So we're going to talk to him about that. I mean, uh, they just they just shot to the top. Oh, man. They They're shot still to at the top. top. I know. Still at the I top. Know. They're amazing. They're amazing. <laughs> so what we're going to do is we're going to give you a little glimpse of the Fab Four, and then we're going to bring our good friend Ron on and uh, chat with him a bit. Yeah, we're going to find right. out how this all got all started. Right. Let's, let's let's taste a little bit of the Fab Four. Help. I need somebody. Help. Not just anybody. Help. You know, I need someone. Hey. Hey. When I was young, I thought my dreams were younger than today. It's been a hard day's night, and I've been working like a dog. It's been a hard day's night. I should be sleeping like a log. But when I get home to you, I want the things that you do will make me feel all right. Oh, I believe in yesterday. Suddenly. I'm not half the man I used to be There's a shadow hanging over me Oh, yesterday came suddenly
Here comes the sun, do 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 do. Here comes the sun, and I say it's all right. Who are those guys? Wow. <laughs> <laughs> Whoever they are, they're pretty phenomenal. <laughs> and, and we got to tell everybody out there, that is not recorded audio just thrown over some footage. That is actual audio, right, Ron? Yeah, yeah. That's us live. Yeah, we multi-tracked it. Yeah, the promo. That's incredible, Well, man. welcome, Mr. Ron McNeil. We, we are so <laughs> Thank thrilled you. to have you on the show. We yeah. are so Thank thrilled. You. Oh, man, this, yeah. yeah, and you guys, I did not know how long you guys have actually known each other yeah it's it's that been is, a long it's time true. it's been a long time i did not i had no idea <laughs> it's been a long time well i mean that's really how it got started was beatlemania once i saw beatlemania i realized that there were other tribute bands like local guys who also imitate the beatles because you know at that time there wasn't like the tribute band thing now is like a whole industry, right? You've got sure. Bob yeah. Seger tribute and Journey and everybody else. There's that Rat tribute in L.A. Tribute to Rat. You remember Rat? Oh my gosh! It's like they had like two songs or something. But um, right. so when we saw when I saw Beatlemania as a kid, I thought, oh, this would be fun to go to. And then I realized that there were some other bands that were performing the music of the Beatles live at these you know, nice little clubs and stuff. And I, I don't think I was even old enough to get into the clubs. But let me <laughs> let me throw something at you. Listen, yeah. listen, Jim. Bucky's. Oh, oh man. and yeah. I know Bucky's. Seamus O'Brien's. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, man. I was, I was there. I was there at those shows. I was watching Jim. Now, a lot of people don't know, but Jim used to perform as Paul McCartney or, you know, playing Paul Parts. Yeah. Um, and uh, with his Hoffner and stuff like that. In fact, I have one story. Went to go see you guys. It was one of those clubs, Seamus O'Brien's or Bucky's. Yes, yeah. And um, I don't even know how I got in again. But um, <laughs> so you had just bought a bass. I don't know if it's the one you currently have, but you had just bought a bass and you were showing it to everybody and everyone's looking during sound check. I got in during sound check and I'm watching you guys. Yeah, and then yeah. you had set the bass down uh -huh. and everyone started to walk away and the bass. Wow. Do you remember? Do you I remember that? That. Do you remember what year might this? What year was this? Oh, now that I couldn't tell you. That I, I definitely don't remember. It's probably around eighty-two or the three. Bass maybe. The bass fell. The bass fell. Well, it didn't fall. The the glue came undone on the neck, and it just collapsed. What? Yeah. Yeah, and I was watching it. I'm in the audience, just watching your sound check. Just you know. <laughs> And I'm watching it go down like, oh my gosh, it's going to, oh, I know something I can do, obviously. I wasn't that close. But yeah, that was that was a trip. But that's how far back I, I used to go see you guys, Rolo and yeah. everybody. Did you guys dig up a photo? Because I'd like to see that. Yeah, did you guys I it. I check did. it out? You, you, you want to see the... Uh, yes, I do. I think yeah. everyone wants to see it. All so right. there it is. Look at that. <laughs> that's the there. 
I, and I, which I still have to this day, and I still play from time to time. You do. Now, yeah. now who are those guys, Jim? Tell me who's that's you on that's you on base, right? Uh, yeah. All right. Uh, go back to the other one. Uh, so, and then uh, of course Rolo is on the drums <laughs> from, the, from the top, and then top. Um, uh, Jonathan Lay is in yep. the middle, who looked exactly like McCartney, but he didn't sing. So right. Jonathan didn't sing. He did not sing. Oh, wow. Uh, wow. So um, uh, the, to his right then is Mark Estes. I don't know if you know Mark. Have you ever Yeah, met? yeah. Yeah, of course. Yeah. He He's out in, yeah. oh, yeah. We, yeah. we still talk from time to time. He's out in Alabama now. Yeah, uh, that's, what, that's when we saw him. Yeah, Rolo, we, we got him into one of our shows, and we talked about old times. Look at that. Rolo was actually young at one time. <laughs> Isn't that weird? <laughs> that's strange. Isn't that hilarious? We have another one, Revolver. Yeah. Oh, yeah, look at that. That was Revolver. That was the uh, the band just before. Well, no, the other one was Revolver, but this was when we had Chris Staley as uh, the, Chris. the genre. I remember Chris, yeah. Uh, and um, yep. man, I haven't seen Chris in years. But do you know Chris Staley? Yeah. Uh huh. Oh, yeah. Yeah, in yeah. the early days, you know, Rolla would introduce us to everybody, but, you know, like I was a fan, so I would come to see, to see her. So as soon as I could drive, so I saw yeah. Beatlemania when I was 13, and then I started coming to your shows when I was 16. Wow. I don't even, like I said, I don't know how I got in the clubs, but they, maybe they just <laughs> wanted business, so they let me in. And of course, I don't drink, so it was just like sipping on a Coke while watching your bass fall down. But uh, those were great times. They were really yeah. inspirational. I was watching you do it all this. Uh, I remember watching you do uh, The Word. You know, oh, doo -doo 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 -doo. I'm like you're singing and playing at the same time. Like, God, that guy's so good. It's like, and there I was dreaming about being on stage and being one of the Beatles. So you're you're a very influential. You and Mitch Weissman, and you know all those commercials we'd see about Beatlemania and all those different things. And it was just like, yeah. I'd really like to do this one day. And one day yeah. I did. Man, I, I, you know, I did not. Incredible. I did not know that you used to go to Bucky's. I I know that Rollo said that you had come to some of the Seamus O'Brien. Uh, yep. shows, but I didn't know that you would come to Bucky's as well. <laughs> yeah, they let me. They let me in. I don't know how. Yeah. <laughs> and now you're one of the. the you're part well, of one of the biggest. Not tribute. one of them. You the are biggest. the biggest. I mean, tribute. Well, now I gotta. I gotta correct you. We are Emmy award winning. There you go. You are. That is amazing. See, that's our Emmy. Yeah. Wow. Isn't that cool? Wow. I mean, but well deserved. Well deserved. No, I, Thank you. So from now on, listen. From now on, you have to refer to us as Emmy Award winning. Okay. Right. Or, otherwise, yeah, I'm just gonna have to leave. You know, all that money I paid you and bribed you, you're gonna have to say it now. Okay. As well but as well deserved. Well as well deserved. as Access TV's World's Greatest Tribute. That's right. TV. And and yep. we're gonna do we're gonna do a reunion in February. I'm working with Katie oh, cool. Darrell. We're doing a reunion. Oh yeah, that's yeah, great. We're, 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 okay, February. Yeah, we're maybe bring we can back. get Ron to come and do do a John. No, Ron, time. are you available in February? <laughs> maybe. I mean, you know, I'll do anything for money. It just All depends, right. you know. <laughs> Him too. <laughs> I'll be John Lennon or Davey or whatever. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter to me. Um, next Tuesday, I'm going to be playing the uh, um, with somebody that you've uh, performed with. Um, I'm doing D Murray with uh, Kenny Metcalf's group. Oh yeah, yeah, well, Kenny's fantastic. Yeah. Isn't he? Kenny's yeah. amazing. He really but is good. On, on Tuesday, but I'm telling you, I've never played any of these songs except for I think I played Benny and the Jets and Rocket Man. So I'm learning like 20 songs. In a week's time. Yeah. Well, yeah. they're not they're not easy bass lines either. No, Those are moving. Cool. They're no, really they're good. Uh, you'll get it. You'll get it. How many tribute bands are you in now? Nineteen? Do we count them? Like twenty. Twenty. Okay. I don't even know. We don't even know. We have yeah. no idea. <laughs> hey, you want to be you want to be Peter Tork in my monkeys band? That hey. would be twenty one. <laughs> are you putting together a monkeys band? <laughs> I don't know. Maybe. <laughs> Just I'm thinking about it. You know, I've always thought about it ever since I, you know, was watching the Beatles groups because the Monkees got me into music in general. So yeah, I always thought yeah. that would be fun. You know. Well, yeah, I saw a video that you made of uh, "You Just May Be the One," my favorite yeah. Monkees tune. Oh, I yeah. love that song. So yeah, me yeah, too. Yeah, that'd be great. You would be Mike. No, I don't. I don't know. We're, I, it's something I've thought about a long time. The hardest part with the Monkees thing is the same thing with the Beatles thing. If you find if you're in a Beatles singing, you find a McCartney who can sing and play, yeah. you're, you're gold. In the Monkees, if you can find a Mickey, That's I right. mean, Mickey sings so high. That's and right. who, could, who can play drums like Hal Blaine? I mean, it's almost impossible. Oh, so, 
call there's a, a shout out to anybody who looks like mickey or can play like mickey there you go you know, then yeah. then you'd have a traditional band but i'm thinking about just starting something that maybe just guys who play the music you know do a tribute to the music oh, instead yeah. of dressing up you know no se second week in a row sam morrison said that was a band that got him into that's music. true that's true. oh yeah Right. You know Sam uh, from uh, Turn the Page. Turn the page. Uh, I don't know him, but I saw I saw the interview. Yeah, that was that was yeah. really cool. Yeah, I mean, for we you know when you're a kid, Sergeant Pepper is too trippy for you, so you're you're listening to something that's a little a little tamer, The Monkees or Paul Revere and the Raiders or something that's you know, not that heavy. And that's what got me started. You know. Wow. Wow. Well, let's well let's dig in. Let's oh, well, dig yeah, in. Let's find out. Okay. Yeah. So, let's dig into Ron. Um, where Where were you born, Ron? Or, or were you from the Seventh? <laughs> Yeah, yeah, I've always lived here. In fact, my uh, you'll see my driver's license or my birth certificate says born in Westminster and my driver's license still says live in Westminster. So it doesn't look like I went anywhere in my life. But <laughs> the truth is, I've been, you know, around the world or whatever. But uh, I actually grew up in uh, in the Inland Empire in Rialto, California. So and that's where, um, yeah, I got most of my um, musical background was from, you know, from playing with guys around in that area and stuff like that. So so i know you talked about uh yeah. scene when you were 16 but what what when did you feel like you wanted to be a musician when did you when when did music kind of touch you well from the early on i'd always be listening to the monkeys and the beatles and then um my dad had this huge classical you know one of those big classical guitars with the nylon strings and the you know the uh, <laughs> you're trying to play the fret and it's like you know you're trying to fret it's like this thick the E strings here, the A strings here, the D yeah. strings here. And as a little kid, you're trying to, so I would sneak in and try to play his guitar. I think he noticed and he bought me a really cheap little guitar, like a, smaller than three quarter scales, you know, like almost, almost a toy from like when you're waiting in Tijuana, you're waiting to come back into California and they sell those little guitars. Well, he bought me a little guitar from Mexico, brought it over the border and I started tuning it up and figuring out how to play. And uh, that's how I got started. Wow. It wasn't. Was what it because I? Say, oh, oh, really, really early. Six, seven, eight years oh, old. Wow. Yeah, really, 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 really early. Yeah, mm -hmm. and um, so I, and then uh, you know, as I got older, I started learning actually how to play, and and that's what got me started. It's all Davy Jones and Mickey Dolans. It's all their fault. Yeah. <laughs> oh so. man. Well, so so you started on guitar, but but um, the the keyboard stuff you do in the Fab Four is is unbelievable. When did you start you. playing the piano? Well, about the same time. So what happened was my dad started realizing I was taking an interest in music, and then my parents bought an organ. You know, those like a Thomas organ, where you got the one level up here, then the other level here, and then your feet play the bass. So I started learning stuff on the organ, just standards, you know, um, whatever, uh, Fascination and Stardust and Alley Cat and all these kind of crazy, like really old songs. And then I realized because you're playing the chords in the left hand, almost like with a piano sound, and you're playing the bass with your feet. And then right. on the top, on the top, you're usually playing a melody, but I started realizing, you know, if I uh, put the flutes and the, and the horns up here, I can do Penny Lane. So I'd be, I would be playing the bass with my feet, wow. the, the, the yeah. uh, chord in my left hand, and then like the trumpet solo or whether the flute's on the top, and I'd be singing. I, I didn't know you weren't supposed to do that, but I just, I, I wanted to fill, I wanted to fill the whole band. And they always had that really crappy drum machine that was built yeah, in. Yeah. It would it never stay in with what I wanted to do. But uh, so that's how kind of that's kind of how I learned. At what age did you start playing the keys? Oh, that was about eight. eight? Yeah, about eight. Oh. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Wow. In fact, yeah, I couldn't even I couldn't even sit on the stool. You know, you have to sit off of it because it was so big. It's like this giant <laughs> thing to me. But I'd always I'd always done that. You know, that's, my, well, I mean, the stuff that you do on keys with the Fab Four, I mean it um it's what makes you guys the best because yeah. thank you you're able to play all of that late material uh that most bands can't cover and you're doing all of that keyboard work which is really intricate it's, it's probably the hardest stuff uh when it comes to playing the beatles music wouldn't you say i mean i, I would say so you know when i used to go see you guys you guys were playing keyboards live and then I went to see Beatlemania, and they had an orchestra. But then when I started getting in the business, most people had a tape. And I'm like, ah, yeah. Yeah, this no. is so cheesy. I can't do that. Oh, no, you're right. You're right. Penny <laughs> Lane. Was, I was like, oh. Just terrible. I hated it. And so um, I just started learning that, uh, 
you know, uh, the George at the time, we got together and said, well, I'll play piano, you play this, and then we just started arranging it like a, like a, like a band would, instead of playing rhythm guitar, I'm playing piano, rhythm piano, and George, instead of playing lead guitar, he's playing the lead trumpet solo or whatever, so right, we started right. to, started to arrange it that way, and it felt like it, it was breathing better, you know, it was like, it was landing better than when you're always locked in, yeah, the tempo's good, but, you know, it just kind of feels like you're, you're a slave to the to the time and like if you wanted to play a little faster you couldn't if you wanted to play a little slower you couldn't right. and so you know depending on what the audience was doing if they if the audience was more up you want to play it faster you know so but yeah. that's, so, i just started so our, doing that. Our, our friend brave says thank you for not using tapes <laughs> <laughs> the authenticity is what makes it that yes, so great. yes well thanks and i felt like it was doing uh the beatles a little bit more of uh, of justice uh, of you know doing it all live too so and that's something we we pride ourselves on obviously I mean, it, yeah, I think a lot of people, a lot of people have the perception that the, playing the, the music of the Beatles is easy for some reason. And it's like, well, you know, maybe some of the early stuff um, is a little on the easy side. But when you start getting into uh, Revolver and later, it, it's extremely difficult to pull that stuff off well. And nobody does it better than you guys. Well, There's thank you. Yeah. Nobody that does it better. Yeah. Well, thank even, you. Even it's even bands that have separate keyboard players. <laughs> you can. Well, thank you. I appreciate uh, that. Well, you know, like I said, we we try our best to uh, to make it as authentic as possible. But um, like you said, it was just a matter of, of of arranging it and stuff. But then we started figuring, well, you know, if I put a Mellotron up here, and then some strings down here, we could do Strawberry Fields. You know, so yeah. we just started getting creative with it. But um, I, I, I'm glad you noticed, and a lot of people um, do notice, and that's what we, like I said, we want to honor the Beatles. We have a very loving, if you talk to any one of us, I mean, we just love the Beatles so much. We, yeah, we couldn't, we yeah. literally could not do it any other way. If we're yeah. sharp or flat or we miss something, that's because we're doing it live and stuff happens during a show, and that's the way it is. I'd rather have it that than to have the tape skip or... You know, how many times you've gone with a click and it messed up, you know, it's like, oh, man, it's just yeah. <laughs> such a drag. Like how cool it is with the track and you're hearing all the strings. Now it's just a drag. Now you've got bass and drums and everyone's looking at each other. And so we wanted to avoid all that stuff. Yeah, no, that's that's the way to go. So, with it. so Gary Grantham uh, asked, do you have a, a, a background in theater at all? Um, not really. Um, like I acted in eighth grade, but nothing, <laughs> nothing like that. But what I did do when I started out, when I was, um, when I was in high school, there was a band that came to our high school. I don't know, maybe this probably happened, probably happened with everybody around our country. Anyways, there was uh, a group called Young American Showcase, which put together these uh, bands that would they would do a school assemblies. They do a concert during the day, and my particular band that I saw was called Free Fair. Free Fair. Oh, wow. So they came, they came to our school. I don't know if you remember this. And then um, they play songs that were on the radio, and it was the 80s at the time or whatever, so they were playing all the stuff that was on the radio. And uh, they said at the end of the show, like, if you'd like to join up with the company, just fill this thing out. If you're 17 or 18, and I was 17, so just fill this thing out, and uh, at the end of the school year, give us a call after you graduate. Um, and so I joined their company, and it was... <laughs> Yeah. It was an eye-opening experience. It really was. Not only I'd never really been in a, I've been in a band like in your in my backyard and stuff, sure. but this was just fully professional. They put seven groups a year together, had them tour around all these schools, and it wasn't just like we did one show. Okay, our schedule was like. In fact, I was looking at it the other day. I busted out one of these schedule sheets because you know this is pre-internet. You can't you know pre-GPS or whatever. Sure. We would play on average. This is an average day. We do a show in the morning, eight o'clock in the morning. We show up to one school, set up. It would take us 20 minutes to set up. We'd have everything in the in the in the van, set up, sound check, do the 45 minute assembly for, for whatever, tear it all down, get back in the in the car. So let's say we we're playing in, oh I don't know, Simi Valley or somewhere somewhere. Then right. we drive. We would drive to Orange County and do a one o'clock show at another school. Same thing. Set up, sound check, do the show get out then wow. we'd have dinner yes and then we'd go to another show that was in maybe i mean sometimes as far as like fresno or something or whatever it's like if we could make the show we do it at seven o'clock at night evening show so we do like three shows a day at three different places uh, five days five days a week 
So, you know, we'd be losing our voices and stuff. I believe that, though. I believe when, that, yeah. when did you start doing that, right? So that was what? about 83, 83, 84. And, and, and so... How long did you... How long of a period were you in? I did the one, the one school year, so it was nine months. Okay. And uh, we had a tour of the South, which was great. You know, Alabama, Tennessee, Georgia. And people are just so cool. over They're so nice. And uh, I really enjoyed that tour. And I learned a lot. And like this company... It's kind of hard to explain, but like most of my training comes from that company, even though at the time it was just a wash because, you know, you're I was 18 years old, so I didn't know what was going on. Yeah. So you just it's, you're just doing what they tell you to do. But then after a while, when I formed my own band, I realized, oh, that's why you open with that kind of song. That's why you don't open your show with Twist right. and Shout because you've blown your load. And as a kid, you don't think about that. But when you're writing a show, you go, well, the Beatles opened with Twist and Shout. It's like, yeah, but that's the Beatles. Yes. You're thinking you can't blow your load in the beginning of the show and expect people to stick around. That's so right. That's we right. started. I started implementing some of those ideas and stuff that I learned. But it's a whole. I can't. I don't even know where to start to tell you how how um, uh, how many concepts were involved. Everything from what happens when you show up to the city or that you're playing or the town that you're playing in. We right. we'd be staying at these motels and they would make us make our beds. They would make us make it. We're a band. We have got long hair and all the thing, you know. And they, we would have to, because the concept was, if the maid comes in, because she lives there, right? The maid lives in town. Sure, yeah, she yeah. Would, and she probably has kids that go to the school that you're playing. So you yeah. want to say, hey, you know those guys? You know, they're like long-haired weirdos or whatever. But did you know they made their beds? And like, like nobody makes your bed at a hotel. We weren't even in hotels. We're in motels. So I think so. So con little concepts like that that keep the positivity going. Everything yeah. to write, how to write a set, what to do when something uh, goes wrong, if the drum riser falls down, which it did during one of our shows, and like a whole bunch of different things. You lose electricity, you lose power, right? Stuff like that happens all the time, right? So uh, to um, to to what happens when you leave when you leave the town? So yeah. and so it was really interesting, and so I tried to incorporate some of those concepts in, into the Fab Four, and it was uh, yeah. it was eye opening. Well, uh, just this well, as an interesting side I mean, note before we get okay, uh, going right, further. Okay, all right. Because I have a question I, too. I, I I've never made my bed in my entire life. <laughs> you would have failed. <laughs> they would have shipped you out. They would have shipped you out. You'd been gone. When Jim Wooten is on the road, I make the bed. <laughs> if he's not on the road, he's in the bed. So I can't make it. That's so it. I can't make it. <laughs> I tell you, I didn't say I make the bed now, but I did then. Otherwise, I get fired. You, 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 you remember when um, Brian Wilson decided he was going to spend an entire year in bed? Well, I've oh, yeah. completely put him to shame. Oh, no. Well, I'm, right I'm famous for my sleeping, too. I can sleep right here. Right. <laughs> um, Marcy has a quick question for you. Uh, what is your favorite color, snack, food, or drink? Oh, and drink. Oh, oh. Wow. Uh, right. Orange, 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 and orange. <laughs> is that right? <laughs> I'm just I'm joking. A uh, 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 favorite color is um, uh, used to be red. I don't know. I don't really have a favorite color. Uh -huh. A snack. I like. Uh, what do I like to snack on? Uh, I like peanuts. Something like that. Peanuts. Peanuts. Yeah. Yeah. And, oh wait. And, what was it? Uh, and um, let's see. Oh. And we food. Ready? I like Mexican food. And uh, to drink, I like uh, Diet Dr Pepper. But I love Dr Pepper. But the the diet one is the great one. You got no sugar, and it tastes just as good. Does it? And I have that Dr yeah. Pepper Zero now, and that's really good too. But I've been trying to cut down on the sodas a little bit. It's just oh, man, so bad, you. especially before you sing. You know how that goes. Yeah, forget it. So we have another one here for you, uh, Ron. Um, you have a most memorable moment on stage with the Fab Four. Tell us about that. Well. I don't know if you know, but we've done all kinds of stuff in our history, and it's very difficult oh, to pick yeah. something it's out. A it's a lot. We, uh, question. we it opened big? for the Who, the actual Who, who at Carnegie yeah. Hall yes. years ago. I remember. And uh, we've, you know, we've been on television a bunch of things. But for me personally, my favorite moment was uh, when we did uh, Happy Christmas, Wars Over. Uh, at the Grove, and we got um, the kids, and you know, like Artie's kids are in there, and and you know, Mike's kids are in there. So that was a lot of fun. That was like one of my favorite moments. Oh, that's awesome. Um, let's see. Uh, 
So Melinda wants to know what is your favorite Beatles song to sing? Favorite. What, what's Ooh, your to favorite? sing? I to guess sing. Twist and Shout. You know. This funny thing about John is like he's had that real gritty thing, like Twist and Shout. Then you got to sing something soft, like A Day in the Life. Then you're yeah. back to screaming yeah. again for you know Revolution or whatever. It's uh, John had such a, a wide range. It's it's very difficult to uh, to do that. Fortunately, my range is actually higher than John's. I think Artie's is for Paul too. Yeah. So you know that on a on a bad day, you know you can still hit it because you're still within that range. So I think that gives me a little bit of an advantage. You know. I think you're right. I, I've, I've noticed that because, I mean, you guys, what, what do your shows normally run 90 to 90 minutes to two hours? Is Artie writing the set list? Yeah, it's about two hours. <laughs> is, that, is that right? But yeah, but uh, they're supposed to be that, yeah. But for but, you yeah. to sing multiple nights, you know, yeah. doing the most challenging vocal tunes, uh, I mean, you're right. You're, you're, um, your voice probably has to be higher than the original uh singers because um yeah, if, if you're having a bad day you won't be able to do a lot but of i was just going right? to say that's very taxing on your voices i mean I oh yeah and it's one of the reasons why i mean i'm glad we're not doing like some of those broadway runs like some of the other guys are doing i mean six to eight shows a week I, there's no way you have to have at least three casts at that yeah. point to do it and we do have enough guys to do that but it's just like you know do we really want to be spending that much time away or 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 singing that much like you said no none of us are you know we're not as young as we used to be too so it's not as far as that goes it's still very difficult to to hit those notes every night absolutely but, so i ask everybody uh that we we've interviewed because they all have been singers has this ever happened to you ron have you ever woke up and said i've got laryngitis i can't do this can't show do it can't do it what, that what, do you many do? Times. what do you do oh yeah well the good thing about the Beatles is just more Paul songs, more George songs, and more Ringo songs, you know, yeah, which yeah, can exactly. help. But if you're like, if you're Springsteen or you know, or uh, you know, uh, anybody that's a solo thing, that, that you're you're pretty much you're screwed at that point. But yeah. we, I, we, I remember one Disney, Disneyland, like New Year's Eve or something, and the only sang, songs I sang were Strawberry, and uh, and Imagine, it was like the only ones I could squeak out. Everything oh, else, wow. I, I couldn't get anything out. And somebody goes, hey, what happened to a, a hard day's night? I'm like, not doing it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So you've never actually had to just say, I can't do the show because I'm just so about Substance. two or three that I can say. Yeah. But then we just we just adjust the show. But yes. there's been times when I've been very, very sick and, and you just, you know, you just go through it. The show must go on. Whoever said that, I want to kill that guy right about now. But, <laughs> yeah. but it's like, um, you know, you just you just do what you got to do. But I have a little bit, you know, getting a little bit older and and learning a little bit more about how to keep your voice and those kinds of things are always right. that helps a little bit. Where when you're young, you just start singing, you don't care oh, about a it. A lot of yeah. cinnamon, a lot of honey, a lot of ginger. Yeah, yep. yeah, got that whole concoction going. <laughs> I found that keeping your voice uh, moist on stage, which is lucky because John John chewed gum. Yeah. That's so, right. And a lot of people are like, uh, you know, that's a little bit rude in, in the in the entertainment business. You don't chew gum. It's like, no, no, John did chew gum. So he did. we're going to do he that. Did. Yeah. Yeah. And, um, John, John. I, I've been talking about hydration for the last few weeks, Ron, because I, I used, I mean, I was dehydrated for so long. And I, years, would, have, I would have days where like, I can't sing today. And then other days I'm like, okay, I'm all right. But since I've been drinking like 14 to 18 glasses a day, I have no problem no every problem. day. Uh, my, and if you have something in too, like um, someone taught us one time, there's nothing around, grab a guitar pick and just literally, just for a little while, for a song you don't sing on, it just starts to get the saliva going. And then yeah. you feel your voice, yeah, your voice feels a lot better at that point too. And then the other thing with the Fab Four is we can't have water bottles on stage, much less, you know, one of Brenda's thing or what, you know, whatever. You can't, you can't have that going. I gotta make so. you one. I gotta make you one. <laughs> So because the Beatles didn't have that, so people are always saying, oh, well, the Beatles, so we don't, if you notice, yeah. we don't take, there's no drinks on the stage, and we never take a drink on stage. There's no glasses, there's no water, there's no nothing, so we have to sneak in. Why is that? Well, because the Beatles didn't do it. People used to tell us all the time, why do you have a water bottle? Like, there weren't even water bottles in the 60s. I'm like, oh, okay, we're trying to make it as authentic as possible, so. Yeah. Their, their shows, though, I mean, they would normally play like a half hour, right? Mm. 22 minutes 22 minutes the beatles yeah i know and you try to explain that to someone and they'll still say well 
you know, they didn't have uh, Avion water in those days, you know, so, whatever. so we got to, we got to make it as authentic as possible, which is cool with the in-ear monitors too, because, you know, oh, Beatles didn't have monitors either. So yeah, now right. we can hear ourselves and we're authentic. We took the monitors that's away. Right. That's right. So it's cool. That's right. yeah. Double authentic. Uh, yeah, absolutely. Um, Todd wants to know now that, yeah, this is an interesting question. I'm glad you brought this up, Todd, because Ron is switching between guitar and keys so often. I, I'm curious about this too. What is the most challenging song to play live where you're just having to go back and forth and it's, you know, it's extremely difficult to make it all happen in real time. Well, as you know, everything after 66, everything revolver on is going to be difficult because there's always some kind of, you know, horns or strings or something like that that you have to end up playing. But I think it's difficult also for the different guys in the band. If you have something like uh, And Your Bird Can Sing, obviously George has to play both parts. And oh, yeah. if you have yeah. something like... Um, you know, oh darling, or something, and Artie's got to go nuts, or or lovely Rita, like he was talking about on your on your program. Um, oh, it's yeah, difficult yeah. to play and sing at the same time. For me, something like a day in the life, or just trying to get it right. When you have so many so many sounds and stuff, trying to cover all that as a four piece yes. is difficult. So that's why I would say, like a day in the life, or something like Strawberry Fields or Penny Lane, or those ones that involve. When I'm 64 is another one. Yeah. So oh, oh, yeah. they well, sound like I'm, simple songs, but they're oh, not. Oh, yeah, no, when I'm 64, there's a lot happening on that. But also, mm -hmm. it blows me away watching you do um, Sergeant Pepper because oh, you yeah. got all that ba 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 and all, you know. Yeah, and then I got to go back to guitar. Yeah. yeah. So we have a Sergeant Pepper uh, here. It's super fun stuff. Oh, hold on, I <laughs> Sorry. Did you, did you uh, load it? I did. Oh, yeah. We got there it is. Right there. So, yeah. You guys, you guys um, actually did the entire album for uh, the Axis TV show. We were there that night, and it, yeah. it was amazing. Oh, were you guys the ones throwing things at us? <laughs> that, was, <laughs> that was crazy. <laughs> we didn't think we were that bad. <laughs> yeah, it was fun. That was man, talk about. And you know the show, World's Greatest Tribute Bands. It's like go, 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 and we're live. Yeah. The world's greatest tribute bands, yeah! <laughs> you know, and so it's like, uh, we're going to do the whole album. But, uh, no, that was fun. We got the Indian guys up there, and that was, yeah. it was really, it was nerve-wracking. Really, yeah. really. Well, um, Ron, the very, well, let me see. The first time I did it was with the long run, the TLR, uh, the Eagles group. And, we go, and, you know, we're all just so jazzed. Go up on stage. And I, I go up to the mic and realize that I didn't plug my in ears into the pack. Oh, oh no, not one of those. Oh my gosh. Oh my gosh. Not that oh, night of all nights, right? Oh my gosh. Oh. So I finally got it plugged in on the third tune, but it, that was rough, man. I, 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 wasn't in, I wasn't enjoying that at all. Everybody does it. Everybody does it at least once. Yeah, you know. exactly. Then you never do it again. Two songs. Two songs. Yeah, exactly. Uh, that, Never yeah, do it again. It hasn't happened since then. <laughs> um, but okay, so, oh, we had a, was there another, I think there was another um, question that I wanted to get to. Oh, uh, actually, Rolo's cousin. I, do you remember Dolly? Dolly. Oh, yeah. Dolly. Hey. Yeah. She's uh, joined us tonight. Thanks for joining. She actually sent those pictures that oh, we, we showed you a little earlier. Pictures. Wow. She says an envelope full of pictures. Yeah, yeah, yeah and amazing. articles, uh, articles yeah. from like the local newspaper. Well, thanks for sending that over. That was really cool. <laughs> yeah, uh, Savannah we love says you, she Ron loves McNeil. you. <laughs> Just wanted to get that in. Hi, Nana. <laughs> um, uh, so, let's see. Oh, um, Gig had something to say here. You, you know, Gig right from the long run. Yeah. Early training and shoe ethics. Shoe ethics. All right, I like it. <laughs> I don't even know what that is. Um, I'm not sure either. I'm not wearing shoes. I can't see. I'm not wearing shoes either. Oh, man. Uh, let's see here. Let's see. Sal had uh, something in here. Um, uh, let's see. Sal, Sal wants to know why I break his camera every time. Yeah, right. That's what he wants to know. <laughs> so Gomez. Oh, okay. Uh, Christina says, uh, Ron, if you had to choose one guitar to play, all the Beatles tunes on, which would it be and why? 
Well, that's a tough thing. As you know, Jim, you cannot get a Rickenbacker sound out of anything else. There's no way. If you're playing Isar standing there on the Epiphone, which would be my guitar that I would choose. I love that Epiphone. Yeah. Um, yeah. It's versatile. You know, it sounds good. can sound like anything. Plays nice. Feels good in the hand. Um, but uh, that, that would be the one. But that's another reason why we have so many dang guitars on stage is you, some of it you just... you. You can't get on some kind of emulator. There's no way to, to, to get those sounds. So. Right, right. I mean, you, you've you probably owned those uh, guitars for for quite a long time now. So you've oh, yeah. a fairly reasonable price. <laughs> well, you know, we just realized at some point, like, because our tours aren't, like, set up like we're, okay, we're uh, in in the West, then we're Pacific Northwest, and we, like, travel. We don't do that. It's like, like uh, our next gig is here, then we go to Idaho, and then we go to New York, and you know what I mean? It's like we're, we're bouncing all over the place. So what we've done is we put a couple of sets of gear together. So we have a, uh, a box which has all the drums in it, a box that has all the guitars in it, all the keyboards, and, and whatnot. And we ship that ahead of us, ahead of time. So we have three, three or four sets of gear. So I have four of those rigs, four of the Epiphones, four of whatever, so that they can crisscross around the country wherever we are. So we yeah. don't have to take as much stuff, you know, just just logistics. But and then obviously there's some of the guitars I like better than others. But uh, they're that, that's how we kind of figured it out. I see. Yeah, yeah. So, so Ron, I have a question for you. Does sure. your, your voice naturally sound like John, or do you? Do you no. Do you think it does? I sound like Davy Jones. <laughs> it's like, you know. Do you, do you work on ma manipulating? A little bit oh yeah yeah my my john lennon is definitely an imitation of john okay. you know you have to do certain things or whatever to your voice like you would imitate any character a cartoon character or whatever it's just it's definitely a, a an um vocalization or whatever you would call it an impression it's, yeah. it's an impression yeah. of john but yeah. uh, i love his voice and of course i love paul's voice but i have an impression of all four beatles it just yeah. it just so <laughs> happened that Artie had that great voice and decided to go left-handed. I was like, well, forget it. You be Paul. Yeah, <laughs> I don't want to be stuck doing that all night. You know, so. uh, now, your, your brother was doing Paul for a while. Is that mm -hmm. right? Yep. He doesn't do it anymore, though. Huh? Yeah, we killed him. <laughs> no, we didn't. So Paul is dead. <laughs> <laughs> no, he's really, really good at it. He's always had kind of a naturally um, McCartney-looking face. Yes. And I kind of got John's nose a little bit, you know, <laughs> but he has Paul's nose and, you know, I started it and he, like when I was gone, he would pick up my, oh, which I didn't know. He would pick up my instruments and start to play because I, nobody really knew my brother as a musician. I was always the musician. And then one day he said, I'd love to do this. You know, I said, so we sat down and started working out harmonies. He's really, really good. But he, wow. yeah, he kind of retired from the business and is just hanging out now. And uh, that was fun. He did a whole couple of years with us in Vegas. Wow. So yeah, he's really good at it. Yeah. You know, one thing I don't think a lot of people are aware of um, uh, about your show, but, but I've come to realize is that you guys are so meticulous in making it sound exactly like the era uh, that um, I know is Mike still doing sound for you. Is that right? Yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. I mean, I, I can't even imagine how you guys have been able to capture the sound of each song. Yeah. Like the early stuff, the, the bass drum is there, but it's not as present as on the later stuff. Right. Just all the effects that are involved. I mean, who went about doing that and, you know, finding out, okay, we need more reverb here. We need uh, some delay here. Who, who um, you know, uh, took the material and broke it all down like that? Well, what's great about our show is the tape doesn't skip. Yeah, so, you know, so that's why it sounds good every time. No, I'm joking. The uh, well, we have these they have these digital boards now, which is really cool. So with the digital board, so he'll go to um, I want to hold your hand or something, sure. and then everything's dialed in what he needs there. The reverbs are here, or whatever delays, whatever he needs to do, and he's already done that pre-show. Uh, you know, and then it gets saved in the board like a patch, like a keyboard patch. Then the next song is Please Please Me. Maybe that has more reverb. I've got yeah. my, har my harmonica, so that needs to be compressed. And right. then it all changes. And then also it changes in the ears. 
So all our mixes change. It's like I need to bring it down, I need to bring it up, and just we travel with this little. It's a little Yamaha board. We travel with it everywhere we go, and so all the songs are saved there that way. So if you need a day in the life, you need the the delay. It's he just pushes the button, day in the life. But yeah, we took a long. And Mike took a long time to sit there and go, you know, what's needed here, what's needed there. We, you know, as you know, yeah. you know, when you when you don't have a sound guy. You know, in the early days, like he's just praying that something, at least they can hear it, you know, much less dial in the correct delays. Hey, I've got, I've got a great soundman story. So before we were the actual, you know, Fab Four and, and I was still the I was still the manager or whatever and all that kind of stuff, 1099ing the guys and all that stuff. We did a gig in Pasadena one time. And so, you know, we didn't have a sound guy and I, the sound guy was really nice. And what I used to do was make sure, I, I'm sure you guys do this too, you make a set list, right, for the yeah. sound guy and the lighting guy, and you say, you know, whatever whatever your notes are. So I gave the, the, the sound guy the piece of paper, and I said, okay. So we're a four-piece band, but sometimes we play like a six-piece because we have the two keyboards on the side. So what you're going to want to do is, I mean, it already sounds great. I, I really appreciate what you're doing. We just need a little bit of like kind of hissy reverb when we're singing and then turn it off when we're talking. Yeah. And he yeah. goes, he goes, well, that means I'd have to run the board all night. <laughs> <laughs> Can you imagine that? Yeah. yeah. So we, did another gig, we did another gig in uh, Wendover. You know, Wendover? There's yeah, a sure. Wendover, Nevada. There's like a casino on one side of the freeway and a casino on the other side of the freeway with a bridge in yes, between. Yeah. And then the highway just goes through and there's nothing else but dirt. Right, right. So we were at the one casino, and it, it, that was a good gig for us, especially in those days, really, really early on. Yeah. And uh, at a really nice little theater there. And the lady who was running lights was, you know, I'd say she was a boomer. You know what I mean? I'd say she she knew the Beatles. You know, I'm like, okay, she, we're going to have a good, you know, at least have a good lighting show. So mm -hmm. on my lighting notes to her, I just said, look, you know, spotlight, it's basically the two of us that sing, John and Paul, so spotlight those that are going and you know some soft light when it's a soft song and some a little bit of a chase going when it's a medium song or a fast song and then to help to help her out a little bit i said um the ones that ringo sings i put the word ringo next to those and she goes which one's ringo what do you think of that which one which one is ringo and then you said Next. <laughs> exactly. I came back to the guys and I said, oh, this is going to be fun. <laughs> so uh, that's some examples. Oh, I have another sound guy. Sorry. So we were also playing in Nevada, some fair. And it's one of those situations, you know, this gym, when, uh, you know, there's one band, then the Eagles band, and then you, and then somebody else, and the dance troupe and whatever on those small stages, you know, and you just come in, set your stuff up real quick, get a quick sense, line check, and then go out and play. Yeah. Well, usually in those days, I'd go out and play, and like in the middle of an early song, All My Lovin' or something, I would just notice, you know, send all my lovin' to you, and I would notice if, don't, 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 if the solo was coming out. So I'd just glance up at the sound guy just to see if he's got it. Yes. You know, because you can see the sound guy go. Sure, sure. You know, you can see him move it up, you know. And he's, okay. Yes. So I look up, and I don't even see him there. And I'm like, <laughs> where is he? And I look four rows up. He's like this. <laughs> he was asleep. He was asleep. Oh man. Oh man, I went ballistic. I went nuts. I'm like You're sleeping during our show? You can't just move a few faders around. And he's like very apologetic. I said, Can you imagine if I went up there as John Lennon and just decided to take a nap in the middle of a hard day's night? You know, I mean, come on, dude. I know. All those things you go through when you don't yeah. You know. But of course now we have sound guys and light guys and the whole thing. So makes yeah. it a lot easier. So the thing that you're seeing is all of that experience put together so that we make sure we don't sound right. awful right. or we don't look awful or, or the sound guy isn't asleep unless Mike hasn't had a nap in a while. You know? yeah. <laughs> so make sure the sound guy's not asleep. Oh, yeah. Man. <laughs> I'm telling it's not you. a lot to ask, is it, Brenda? <laughs> <laughs> well, well uh, Ron, what, one thing that we've really um, uh, got in our favor with Led Zepp again is that when we go uh, to another country to play, uh, you know, there's you, you think there's a lot of inept sound people in, in, in the United States. 
Oh. We'll go to another country, and these people are just this side of brain dead. And uh, I'm literally like, uh, Swan will go out front, listen to the band, and it, Swan just, runs the sound it just sounds like yeah. a train wreck. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But Swan is an excellent sound man. Oh, yeah. Run sound for you guys. Yeah, he used to run sound for us at, uh, at Scruffy's. Yeah. He walked out to the front yep. with the mic. Well, well, yeah. Well, yeah. and he, he'll, um, he'll actually say, hey, you know, um, uh, would you mind if I, you know, just did a few adjustments on here? And they let him do it. And then they're like, oh, wow, yeah. you know, who's this guy? You know, and, and yeah, it, well, there's the language barrier too. You know, yeah, no yeah, one can speak right. the language. It's, it can be, right. it can be difficult. Right. Well, so we try to take, you know, our crew with us as much as we can. Yeah. Sure, sure. Um, oh, okay. So uh, Yvonne wants to know um, when you're on tour, do you bring your families with you? And, uh, did you ever meet Paul, Paul or Ringo? Well, two separate questions. Uh, you know, local shows, you know, you'll see our families there. Um, but not they don't travel that much unless it's something exciting, Australia or Japan or something. Sometimes somebody, one of the wives or somebody will say, hey, I want to go. It's like, of course. Yeah, no problem. As long as you run sound and don't fall asleep at the board, it's good. <laughs> but... Uh, <laughs> And then, uh, no, I've never met Paul Ringo. I met Pete Best. He was really cool. He's really, really nice. Yeah, oh, wow. real early, real early in my career. It was really nice. I didn't know what to ask him because I'm sure everybody asked him all the questions. So I asked him. I noticed that on the Decca tapes yes. that George sang a lot of songs. Like George has a, a complete third, if not more songs than John, if you notice, on the Decca oh. tapes. And so I asked him, I said, did George really sing that much? And he said, you know, well, you know, the boys, you know, whatever. I can't do his accent. Yes, it was very yeah. quiet. And he said, no, that all three used to be lead singers. That was Paul would sing a third, George would sing a third, and, and John would sing a third of the songs. And I thought it was really interesting. Yeah, that is. That is. Wow. Um, wow. Uh, uh, Ray says when he first heard the Fab Four at Disneyland, he came to the conclusion that their sound man was a genius and that's maybe most, the most important <laughs> member of the band. Don't say that. They're going to have to pay the sound guy more. <laughs> Not good. It's funny. We've been through a bunch of different sound guys and a bunch of different things, but you know, mainly it's Artie and I getting on each other's case about sounding. I think I think the key to the Beatles is the vocals. That that really is the key. Yeah, like, because uh, any good, you, not anybody, but if you pick up a Rickenbacker, and I remember the first time I plugged my Rickenbacker into an actual Vox, because for most of my career I used uh, early part of the career I used a Fender, because uh, I only had a Fender amp. I didn't have any money to buy a Vox amp for crying out loud. I remember the first time I plugged it into a Vox amp, and I thought, there it is. It was like, whoa. Yeah. I, it just, it was the sound. But yeah. it's like, um, you know, anybody can, if, if you have a Rick and you have a Vox and you learn the part, you can get really close, but it's the vocals that really count. I think that's what sets people apart. I mean, when I met Artie, that's why we, I, I was so uh, excited to play with Artie. I was just like, oh my God, this guy sounds exactly right. like Paul McCartney. And then he says, oh, I'm gonna. We're gonna make it the ultimate tribute. I'm gonna go left-handed. I said, "Knock yourself out, dude." But he did it. He did it. He did. Oh man, it, that I remember when that happened. Then I'm thinking, uh, that's commitment. <laughs> that's, yeah, that's, that's real. Commitment. It is difficult. Then he started driving backwards and you know brushing his teeth with his left hand and everything. It's cool. Yeah. <laughs> well. Um, man, we had a bunch of questions lined up, but everybody's brought so many questions. So in. many we questions. Well so, so right maybe, to. maybe Ron, you could go through how the, how it all the happened. Five hundred questions. Oh that, yeah, yeah. Oh. Make sure to look through them all after <laughs> yeah. after you're done on the thread. There's there, a lot. There's a lot. There's but, a lot that we wanted to address, and but, a lot that we missed. But, but so. yeah, but no, I want to find out what year did the band start? Yeah. Who put it together, and how did you go about? finding the players for each position. Yeah. Well, we've already that? gone over time, right? How long is the broadcast? Well, no, we, no, we're no, good. We, we, we have no time limit. <laughs> well, basically, I saw Artie and, I mean, uh, Rollo and I saw Artie at Beetlefest with his band, Glass Onion. And he was just a little kid with this giant bass guitar. Um, and he sang Coming Up by Paul McCartney. And it was just, I, I just... It was almost like some weird trick. It's like, how's this kid sounding exactly like Paul McCartney? And then a few years later, we got together. Rollo, you know, started playing with him in some Beatle bands or whatever. And then 
we kind of got together, Artie and I, and uh, for a long time we were looking for a George, and then uh, we found Mike, and that's pretty much how it formed. Uh, you know, late uh, mid '90s, I would say. You know, it's when yeah. it started really going for us, and we we did like every other group, paid our dues. We played at uh, Music City over here in, in Orange County, and then we played uh, Scruffy O'Shea's, which was in L.A. by the airport, and like you would. You know, when we first started playing, there was nobody there. And then by the time we left, you couldn't get in. You know, Swan running sound for us. And it, yeah, it was yeah. it was, it was an event. We'd had celebrities um, coming in. And Mickey Dolans came up and sang with us a couple times at Scruffy's. I, and, I was there and, that night. I were was, you? I, I, oh, wow. Wow. That was so much fun. I remember, fun. I remember so cool. going to the restroom, uh, um, standing at the urinal and looking over and going, that's Mickey Dolans right next to me. <laughs> was he singing? I, he was he singing? Was he singing? <laughs> <laughs> was it peeing next but to you? He was actually. And I'm thinking, okay, I'm thinking something special is going to happen tonight. And sure enough, he came out and sang with you guys. That's awesome. And I thought, oh, this is, this is cool. amazing. Yeah, it was a thrill. It's a thrill for me. Man, that is amazing. But So, uh, Rolo started playing with Artie and some other bands, and then they hooked up with you. Is that right? I mean, yeah, uh, that's kind of how it worked. Yeah, uh, Artie and Rolo were, were you know, a team. You know, bass and drums, and uh, yeah, for the longest time we looked for a George. We had, uh, you know, David Brighton was our George for a while. Sure. Yeah. And then uh, yeah. we had Jimmy Poe coming in and out. It was just like anybody who could put on a George suit just to, sure. just to try to get the thing going. And then, uh, you know, finally we landed on Mike. And then we uh, opened the show in Vegas, and we needed a whole second cast. So I was hearing about this guy Gavin and how good he was. He was living in Chicago at the time. Yeah. And I uh, I called him up and I said, hey, uh, would you want to come down to do this? Because he was kind of, I think he was thinking about just going home because some of the work had dried up in in, uh, in Chicago. Yes. He yes. says, uh, well, mates, I'll come out and see it. And if it's, you know, if it's any good, I'll stick around. But, you know, really, I just want to go home. Just want to go home, see me mom, you know. I was oh. like, all right, well, just check it out. And he, he never left. So we moved Mike over to sound and we've been together ever since. Well, it's funny because when I was in high school, um, the first group I was in, uh, Rolo was the drummer. And, um, you know, then we, st what happened, the reason we got into doing Beatles was we were playing in a, like a, well, it, it wasn't classic rock then, it was just rock. <laughs> right, <laughs> top 40. Yeah. Yeah. The band was called Obsession, Obsession. and we, we were doing, you know, we had a great lead singer. The guy was able to do Zeppelin, Journey, Kansas, you know, all of those extremely high uh, vocal tunes. And we were doing that, and he moved away. So we're looking at each other going, we don't know anybody else that can sing this stuff. Yeah. What should we do? And then we, we came to the conclusion, well, what about the Beatles? We can sing that stuff, you know, and, and so we, we started doing it. And... Um, uh, Rolo actually did not like Ringo or the Beatles at that time. Did he ever tell you that? <laughs> wow, no. I mean, I know he's a big Zeppelin fan. He, wow. he didn't. He didn't like it. He he's like, yeah, I'm not in, really into doing this. And and so, um, uh, one night we were at a, a somebody's house uh, at a party, and this guy had a great sound system, and he put on the Abbey Road album, and Rolo listened to the drums on that, and he's all. This is awesome, <laughs> and so he got into it at that point, and and I knew uh, once I stopped playing, I got married, stopped playing in bands for like eight years. But I knew that Rolo would hook up with with somebody good because he was such a great drummer. Good drummer. And oh yeah, he was he was a great singer, and I thought, oh man, he's gonna go far in this. And before you know it, he's playing with you guys, and I'm thinking, oh man. The perfect situation for yeah. him. You know? Oh, yeah. Rolo's amazing. He really is. I hope he's not watching. <laughs> but, uh, he, <laughs> he really is great. I mean, Rolo can play anything. And, you know, he's always trying to figure out, well, there's a tambourine and a shaker on that song. So if I put the tambourine here and the shaker, you know, in my shirt, I, know. I, can, I can play it all at the same time. And he's just, he's always willing to, you know, try other things, which is great about Rolo. That's but he's very versatile, very funky, like... Yeah. If he starts playing a beat, people just start dancing right away. You know, he's a really, really <laughs> excellent drummer. And he's been hired to do all kinds of studio stuff. He played on uh, uh, one of Brian Wilson's albums, and he played on Mickey Dolan's yeah, album and stuff like that. He's just, yeah. yeah, so it's, it's been a pleasure. Yeah, He's yeah, fired. Yeah. I'm going to fire yeah. him. <laughs> well, now, I, 
as far as like your involvement in the playing live for a while there, you stepped out of the picture. Uh, Don't remind me. Don't remind me. It's the best right. year and a half of my life. Is that right? No, I mean, it was cool. I mean, you know, I've been doing it 25 years. Yeah. And it's yeah. like, you know, at some point I did the idea was to find somebody who could take my spot. And we met Adam from the bootleg Beatles over there in England. Yeah. And just started talking with him and said, you know, is it possible for you to come over here and and and, and join the group? And the minute he said yes, man, I mean, I mean he's a... He's freaking amazing. He looks like John. He sounds like John. He has all these new keyboard stuff, which is, I was like a pioneer when I came out, but that's like in the 90s, you know what I mean? Yeah, and yeah. Adam has all this new stuff that really, he can layer all these different sounds and stuff like that. And he's just been a, and on top of being, just being a great guy and all that stuff too. So that was a great, great year and a half. I didn't have to wake up at any time, put my feet up on the desk, you know? Yeah. You know what I'm saying, bud? Just whatever, <laughs> you know, booking the group. I didn't even book the group. I just... You know, but you probably so, needed you needed a break. You needed a break. I did. Yeah, and, I did. And yeah. Now, now that you've had that time off, uh, are, are you going to stay in in live performance for for a while here, or what is your plan? Well, doing? you know, I'd like to stay in it as long as uh, as long as I'm needed. I mean, yeah. I don't want somebody to say, "Hey, Ron, you know, time to." time to hang it up and I, I'd rather I'd rather go on my own terms that's why I was so excited when when Adam did come in because you know nobody's getting any younger and you know you know what it is it's not about the music traveling is the is the problem you know I think Mickey oh. Dolan says that he says we get paid to travel see we, we sing for free yeah you know it really life. is yeah all the aches and pains and all that stuff but we're, we're always looking you know we're always looking for people to come in and that's what's great about us the Fab Four most people don't want to start a band on their own they want to join the fab four and right. we're more than willing there's some 20 year olds out there that want to do it you know give yeah. me a call I'd, I'd love to have you on it's just uh you know we always we're always looking for young talent and that's how we get some people in, in our group to uh to cover what we're doing so that we can continue to do this i don't know if you know but you know rollo and i and, and the other guys were all business partners as well absolutely so. yeah so, and, yeah. and you kind of uh, went into like more of an administrative or, or um, maybe like production role. Uh, yeah, I count paper clips. And Is that, that Yeah, I, I, that's my I, official I, job I, role. Yeah, paper clips. He can do that. You know what I do? I put it on my Facebook too. I'm I'm uh, Ron McNeil, president and micromanager of the Fab Four. <laughs> that's what I do. Micromanage. <laughs> That's great. Are you the, the stickler in the group, the guy that says, hey, guys, we, no, we got to tighten that up. To be that here up. at this time. Uh, or, or no, late. I mean musically. Oh, Are okay. you the guy that musically, <laughs> you know, uh, keeps things in shape? Or We do have some set rules in the band. One is show up on time. The yeah. other is make sure your costumes are look nice and are pressed yeah. or have been to the dry cleaner. And the other one is I don't allow any drinking during the, st during the show when you're on my time. You're yeah. on my time. After that, you can do whatever you want. But those that's are right. really that's the only right. three rules. Actually, and the other rule is don't listen to Artie. That's the, that's the <laughs> other rule. But other than that, it's good. Well, Artie, are you on with us? Yeah. <laughs> now, when you guys um, uh, started the band, who arranged the vocals? Uh, Ron, did you take that on yourself? Or? Mostly us. Artie's got a good ear for that, harmonies and stuff like that. And we just both kind of... You know, and a lot of it's double and triple track. So, you know, we just try to just, yeah, try to arrange it that way. Mostly yeah. me and Artie. Yeah. 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 Um, so, so uh, at this point, it, will Adam rejoin the group, uh, you know, once um, everything is uh, back up? And, well, everything is pretty much back up and going. Kind of. Close, close. You know, every country's different. England's had a little bit of a problem. So uh, we're hoping, you know, we just have to see yeah. what happens. Uh, yeah. We, we just all gelled so well, and the, and the band was doing so well at that point. Um, we hope so, but we don't really know what's going on. Adam's right. had a new had a new baby, and, and there's other things going on in people's lives who are, yeah. I don't know, we'll, we'll just see. In the meantime, if you're a guy who looks like John Lennon and, and sounds like him, you know, just <laughs> give me give me a buzz. Or any of the other Beatles, or any monkeys. If you, yeah, if you yeah. look like Mickey Dolenz and can play, just, just give me a buzz or whatever. Here, here's an interesting thing. When you took all that time off and you came back, was it like... I, I got real big. I Just eating and drinking. <laughs> anyway, go ahead. I think, I think, yeah. I think everybody well, did that. 
I mean, from a playing perspective, though, were you like, man, how did I used to play that? Did, did it get to that point, or were you like, oh no, this is so much? Uh, it's only know. a year and a half, Jim. It's not like you know, I, like <laughs> we tired for forty years or whatever. But no, no, it was uh, some year. of it was some of year. it was. When we came back from COVID, when we came back from COVID, Artie saying all this stuff, it's like, no, you're not supposed to say that till the end. Oh, yeah, I forgot. It's been so long. But some of it, but we got back on the horse pretty quickly, I think. Yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, are, now are, are you enjoying uh, live performance again, or are you kind of like, mm, okay, I'm about ready to take another uh, break? Or what, what another, I mean, Jim, Jim, he's on talking about, like, I, I miss COVID. I'm like... <laughs> Yeah, I miss the pandemic. Break. He, he's saying he's like, I miss the pandemic. I'm like, yeah. oh, well, I mean, know, we didn't hate it. We didn't not hate at it. all. Yeah, it was it a was, nice break because we were so crazy. Th this we year is my 20th year in Zep again, and pretty much every single weekend for the last 20 years we were playing. Yeah, right. That, it was nice to catch up on our and, Netflix. But I'll tell you, once <laughs> we did a show after that long a period of time, Ron, I got in there and I. You talk about blisters. blisters on your <laughs> Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. It was weird. Well, we played a little bit during COVID. We did some of those live streams and stuff like yeah. that. But, yeah, you're yeah. right. It was uh, it was definitely an experience. But uh, I, I still enjoy playing. Like I said before, I think just the travel is starting to get it. And being away from the family and being away yeah. from home causes yeah. a lot of problems. But, um, I, I, you know, when the music hits... You know how it is. Just you start going into that mode when you were a kid, just listening to it, and you're experiencing it just as much as 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 the audience is. You're you're appreciating it. And I look over and I see Gavin, and he looks like George and Artie up there screaming his lungs out. It's it's cool for me. It's a cool experience for me to do, do that and watch kids of all ages singing right along with you all the songs that you grew up with, and you realize these kids weren't even born in the '70s or '80s, much less in the '60s. And it's yeah. just, it's great to see that. Well, and also, it's got to be so cool, like you said, to look around on stage, uh, the crowd's going absolutely berserk, and to realize I'm playing with absolutely the best band doing what we're doing in the entire the world. Band. And, and I, I mean, I've seen all of them, Ron. You guys, you. nobody touches you guys. It, it's, it's not well, it looks like you, you, the, the check I wrote you cleared, so that's good. I yeah, appreciate yeah, you saying guys. that about us. <laughs> Emmy Award winning. Emmy Award. No. No. We're going to the Bahamas next Bahamas. Week. <laughs> oh, Good. Good. Thanks. I'm glad you're doing something good with the money. No, but, you know, and not only not only playing with guys that, you know, that are really good, like you said, but also watching the audience. Uh, that's one of my favorite things. You know, and after a while, you know, we pretty much do the same show everywhere we go. We throw in, we try to throw in different things for people, requests or try to change it up for our own sanity but you can't do a show with the Beatles without she loves you and twist and shout and a hard day's night and then it's like well let's do spoil the party it's like okay I know it but what are you taking out because you can't sit there for three hours that you know we got another show to do the next day so do you take out she loves you, you take out a hard day's night you take out yesterday to do spoil a party I don't think so no. so it, it yeah. the, the set list is always pretty much the same and a, a little while there towards the end of when I was doing it, maybe 2018 or so, it was starting to get to me a little bit, starting to get to my brain a little bit. Yeah. And I was really happy to find Adam. But one of the things I do, I don't know if, if you do this at all or, or if other people have told you this, but one of the things I like to do, I get about half made up, get the sideburns on and do the whole thing. And about a half an hour or 20 minutes before the show starts, I'll go and I'll peek out the curtain and I'll look at the audience and there's people, you know, putting their kids up on stage and taking pictures with the guitars and all that kind of stuff. And I realize these people have never seen a Beatles tribute. They've never seen, much less seen us. And they're like hearing that music live for the first time. They're going to be blown away. And so that's part of um, my motivation. I go and look and realize that part of our job is to make, <laughs> I use this every once in a while, but part of our job is to make people happy while your life maybe isn't so happy. You have to pretend like it is and go out there and, 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 and really take those people away from their problems. That's that's our job, and that's we take it seriously. And it Absolutely. may be a 17-year-old's first time ever seeing you guys. And yeah. 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 It could be their Buckies or yeah. their Seamus O'Briens. Yeah. 
You're yeah. right. It yeah. could be inspiring yeah. them that, to, that, to that, yeah. carry on the That's legacy. Right. Oh, we see it all the time. Some of the kids, uh, some of the guys in, uh, I call them kids, some of the guys in Britain's Finest and some of the other guys would say, oh, we used to come to see you at Disneyland when we were teenagers. I'm like, oh, yeah. Now, yeah. now I feel old. <laughs> but yeah. it really is true. Like, you keep inspiring. And then those people will inspire and the music will keep carrying on, hopefully. So, knock, on so knock on wood, our, you know. Our, yeah. our lead singer always says, keeping the music alive. Keeping the right. magic, yeah, keep it the, the magic music and the magic That's right. Yeah, it's, yeah. It's, it's important. Yeah, you know, it's funny too. Um, Ron, the Beatles and Led Zeppelin have a lot in common in that um, we both have a huge teenager yeah. Uh, yeah. audience out there. You'd be surprised. Yeah. Um, if whenever we have an all ages show, I'm like half these people, fourteen year olds, are like yeah, <laughs> anywhere from fourteen to you know thirty years old. That's right. And, but not a lot of bands have that. I, I, I have to say, there's a lot of bands where the demographic is 40 and over for the most part. Oh, yeah. Ours is 60 and over. But it's... Yeah. I, well, <laughs> but, yeah. it's but it's still, it still is cool. And you realize that, you know, a lot of people say, oh, the kids, they don't know. They don't know good music. But that's they, that's no. bull. That's they, bull. They, they all, they're just turning on to it is what happened. My son yeah. always saw, I, my son came in one time and said, uh, Daddy, have you ever heard of uh, Alan Parsons? Alan Parsons band? I'm like, of course. You know, and he, when he turned on the Fleetwood Mac, I'm like, you know, kids got good good taste, you know. And I never, because I never, we didn't play that stuff too much in our house. We were playing always the Beatles or whatever. But just him discovering that stuff and you realize that good music is good music no matter what happens. Yeah. That, and that leads us to our next question. What, what are some of your other favorite bands, Ron? I mean, if you were to name like the top five. So if you were to drive down uh, 101 <laughs> on your way to Santa Barbara and you got In the, the traffic. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> what, what, would you, what would you play? Aside from Oh, uh, uh, It would be Pisces Aquarius, the monkeys. Yeah, I'd be playing the monkeys. I know my various rarities and mixes and stuff like that. But I'm pretty... As far as like my tastes go, I like a bunch of stuff. Um, like I said, I, stand, I started out playing like standards and stuff like really old time music. And uh, I like a little bit of uh, uh, pretty much of everything, but mostly classic rock is what I like. But if you look at my record collection, you're going to see just the Beatles, the Monkees, Duran Duran, and Jellyfish. That's all that. you're going to see. <laughs> no, um, did you ever uh, like anything that uh, CSNY did? Oh yeah, of course. Oh yeah, like like that other stuff I listen to, but you won't see me. I won't buy it. I mean, I have a Prince album here and there, or whatever the thing is. But the thing that I'll actually spend my money on are just those bands I named. But yeah, um, all that stuff in the '70s. You know, that's the stuff we grew up with, right? We'd hear that stuff on the radio. In fact, when I was a kid, uh, I was listening to AM radio all the time, and I would know. I'd listen to Casey Kasem, you know, oh, yeah. his American Top 40, and I would listen to all the tracks. So I knew all those songs, all the one-hit wonders and, and everybody. I would keep track of what was number one this week and what was going to be number one next week and all that kind of stuff. So all that stuff from the radio, Queen, ABBA, sure. all that stuff that we have a tribute band to now. You know, yes, that's the stuff yeah. I would listen to, yeah. Yeah. And then Duran Duran was my Beatles at my I time when I, when I was growing up, yeah. 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 Uh, yeah. Duran Duran, Flock of Seagulls, did you Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> John Taylor uh those bass parts are so good so good i i love playing that stuff i've never been in a band where we've actually played any anything from uh, duran duran but there you go I, hey there's another one there's another yeah. tribute for you <laughs> hey i don't think there is a duran duran yeah there, there are it, there are some yeah there, there, are, some. Yeah, there are some but yeah. Uh, um yeah no i love his bass playing it's oh just yeah so good so good um but so uh, I think we, we talked earlier about if you had the time to do another tribute. So it would be the monkeys. monkeys. It would be the monkeys, for sure. Yeah. yeah. In fact, uh, with Mike and Mickey kind of making their farewell tour, I, mean, I think I might have a market for it. It's just tough because a tribute band, you know, like I don't think I'd play Dave. I'd have to lose 100 pounds to play Davey. And it's like, <laughs> <laughs> and, and, you know, and be 30 years younger, at yeah. least 30. Well, um, um, but the monkeys it would, would be yeah. it. After that, I'm not really sure. I, I'd like to see a good you know, Duran Duran. I, I've seen some of the yeah. bands; they're, they're really good and stuff like that. But uh, the monkeys would probably be next in line. Well, um, I don't know if you, you knew, but uh, it had to be about well, it would have been eight years ago now. Um, 
Mike Nesmith's son was doing the Jimmy Page and Led Zeppelin again for oh, two yeah. years. And uh, so yeah. when, when that was happening, he was also touring with um, with the Monkees. Yeah. Right. Because uh, Davey had just passed. That's right. And Mike rejoined the group. And so uh, Christian was in the backing band with his dad there. So yep. we, got to, uh, we got to go to one of the dress rehearsals and saw the whole show and met uh, um, you know, Mike, uh, Peter, and, and Mickey afterwards. And it, what a thrill that was. That was, that was really a great fun. tour, too. That was really good. I just talked about it on, uh, on the Monkees podcast, the tour oh, okay. after Davey passed away. I thought that was one of the really, one of the better tours. It was yeah. really, really good. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah and Christian was there playing. You know, yeah. with his dad, it was so cool to see, and yeah. he's he's great on his own. Yeah, man. just yeah, so man, fun. what a phenomenal guitar yeah. player that guy is. Yeah. I mean, he he had the entire song remains the same album down. I mean, he knew every That's lick right. on every song. It, it was a, it was a pleasure to play with him. Very talented guy. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, all right. Well, I mean, I guess uh, I, do we have any other questions that we can throw at you here? Um, oh, uh, by you the way. The Good. Oh, well, I'm sorry. What was that? Mm. I said the question I get asked most is where's Artie? Oh, where's that, Artie? That used, to be, that used to be the question I get all the time. Now it's where's Gavin? <laughs> where's Gavin? Yeah. <laughs> well, um, let's see. Uh, Tony wants to know what's the biggest venue the band has played and was it hard capturing that sound the Beatles had live? That's a good question. We played um, the Hollywood Bowl for like a thing that they were doing for the anniversary. That was fun. Um, my favorite venue, and I, you know, we play Pacific Amphitheater every year at the, at the Orange County Fair, and that's about, I want to say, seven or 8,000 people. That's a really great gig, too. I think it's probably the most we play on a steady basis. Another group, um, um, place I like is the um, Casino Rama, which is up uh, north of Toronto in Canada, and that's that's a really great place. I think Ringo recorded a live album there, and the Monkees recorded a live album there. And it's it's that's one of my favorite venues, uh, Casino Rama up there. Oh. Really cool, eh? Yeah, <laughs> really cool, eh? <laughs> um, uh, yeah, he says, was it hard to capture the the sound that the Beatles have live? Well, we're mostly going for the records. I mean, a lot of a lot of bands will play the live versions, but. Most people don't have Hollywood Bowl. I mean, us big fans, obviously we do, but um, uh, we try to recreate the record the best we can in a live situation. So, um, and there was a couple times when, we, if we were performing the Beatles at the Hollywood Bowl or the Beatles in Japan, that we tried to make it sound more like that, like that live thing. And it's difficult no matter what you do with the Beatles. It's never, never easy. Never an easy task. Yeah. Yeah. Um, one of our uh, friends, Ray Kokel, um, said, uh, he, he actually does the um, David Gates part in the Bread Tribute that I'm playing oh, with. Oh, wait, wait this, that's I, not the I Bread Tribute. Show, <laughs> no, I wanted to that show. That doesn't look like bread to me. <laughs> no, but this is, this is such a cool picture right here. Yeah, that is awesome. It's a good one. Uh, yeah. Um, yeah. What um, were you saying about bread? Yeah, yeah. So he, uh, he. I, I don't know if you know this, but um, the song "Saturday's Child" Ray says is um, off of the first Monkeys album, and that was written yep. by David Gates. David Gates, yeah. What a great song, too. Yeah. yeah, one of his early. You know, in the in those days, everyone's trying to get a Monkeys record. Every songwriter is trying to get it because they know it's going to sell millions of copies to twelve-year-old girls. But whatever, <laughs> it doesn't make any difference. They get their song out there. That's why the monkeys' music is so great. I mean, yeah, you had Leonard McCartney, but you had all these other people writing for the for the monkeys, uh, Carol yeah. King and Neil Diamond, and yeah. all these other great, great yeah. songwriters. And then they're being played by studio musicians and sung by the monkeys. Yeah. No wonder it was great. Yeah, that was yeah. that was a, a David Gates song. Yeah, Saturday's Child, a great song. Um, somebody said, "Did any of the Beatles ever come to see you or react to?" Oh, work? see her, see her work. Yeah. You know, um, I don't know. Uh, there was a rumor at one show we did Paul McCartney's birthday at the House of Blues in L.A. When it, you know, yeah. And uh, one year, and somebody said, "Oh yeah, that you know, he either pulled up or was going to go or something like that." But is that that's as far as we know, as far as our actual live shows. And we just heard recently that somebody interviewed Ringo and asked him about us, and he says, oh, "I can't go. It's going to be too accurate." <laughs> <laughs> 
you know, or something like that. I don't know. Is that what he said? <laughs> oh, I got a great story for you, uh, Ron. Um, at yeah. the club in Agora. Uh, you know how they always run the ads for the shows that are coming up? Um, yep. Well, do you remember Herman, the sound man? Oh, yeah, yeah. Okay, so uh, he's sitting at the bar, and um, McCartney went to see, uh, what's the guy's name? Uh, Blinded Me with Science. Uh, oh, oh, Thomas Dolby. Thomas yes, Dolby. Yes. He went wow. in to see Thomas Dolby there. Oh, my gosh. McCartney comes up to the, to the, uh, to the bar, and Herman's standing there getting a drink, and McCartney's looking at the at the ads. He sees the Fab Four, and he's all, "Hey," he 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 nudges Herman. He's all, "Are these guys any good?" And he's all, "Yeah, if you like Beatles." <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's great. That's classic. Oh Had my god! I hadn't heard, heard that story. That's so cool. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure. I'm sure McCartney. You know. He knows. He yeah, knows. everyone has YouTube. Every other year. If somebody was playing me, I would want to see that. I'm, I'm sure yeah. he's seen it. And when the, some of the guys in his band, we know that they have our Christmas album and we're playing yeah. that. So that's really cool. I mean, how yeah. flattering is that? You know, isn't that great? Yeah, yeah, yeah that is great. But um, uh, yeah, I just thought I'd share that with you. I think I told Artie when he was on it a while back. It's that's great. a great story. Yeah. <laughs> and you like the Beatles, You're right? right. <laughs> Oh man! Well, <laughs> hey, Ron, we can't thank so you so much enough, fun with you. Uh, oh man, for, for thank you so show, much man. for being with really us. Thank you, thanks for having me. I really enjoyed it. <laughs> we will have a. We need to have a, a shout or revolver reunion, and you guys can get back and and do it. That would be fun. That would be a lot of fun. Yeah, maybe when Mark uh, Estes comes back, <laughs> you can have the trip. Have the trip open for you. There you go. You, you saw the trip, right? Oh uh, yeah. Oh yeah. How, now you remember Brad the singer? Uh huh. Oh yeah. You heard him do John Fogerty? Well, you, I'm sure they did some during the trip. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Oh yeah. That goes real versatile. Yeah. Well, all those guys were were real versatile. Oh, yeah. Yeah. We had him on a while back there, Ron. That guy nails John Fogerty. If you like Creedence, this guy is so oh, yeah. good. But, uh, th that's what he's doing now. Yeah. Um, uh, yeah. Brad is doing that now. Uh, so, but, you know, oh, I guess our, oh, our, our dogs, uh, our dogs are letting me know they have to go. Oh, oh, <laughs> you know what? I got, I got to go outside too. So maybe this is a good time. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Ron. Well, thank you so much for joining us, man. We really oh, appreciate it. We had such it. a good night with you. And thank you, thank so you guys. We've got to have all of you guys on. Uh, well, maybe we'll have Rolo, Gavin, you, and, and Artie on. That would, that would not be a good thing. You won't be able to get a word in edgewise, believe me. Not the way those guys talk. No way. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Well, thank you so much. And, uh, yeah, hope we're going to have you on again. I mean, yeah. this, this was really interesting. Sure. We really appreciate you spending the Maybe you ask me some of the questions that you had planned. It's, you know, that would be exactly. cool. Exactly. We didn't even get to that. <laughs> we didn't even get. Oh, wait. Now, uh, Melinda has one last question. Is John Lennon your favorite Beatle? Oh, Ooh, this is going to be a this is going to be a big secret. No, he's yeah. not. Paul he's Paul true. Paul was always my favorite Beatle. Oh, wow. And, wow. and John is Artie's favorite Beatle. So it's yeah. nice to be kind of like, hey, you're imitating my hero. You're imitating my hero. Well, you better oh. do it right. You better do it right. So that's, I think that's what keeps us on our toes. Yes, awesome. absolutely. Oh man, well that's a great question to end it on. <laughs> well, thank you so much once again, Ron. We appreciate it, and uh, thank hopefully you. We'll be at a, soon, uh, a show soon. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Hey, Ron, so have a so great good night. To see you. And uh, look over all those questions. Yeah, I'm sure yeah. there's some we can ask. I'll write, I write him in like an essay, like homework. I'll send him to you. <laughs> you can grade me. <laughs> all right. Okay, Ron. Take Thanks. care. Have a great night. Okay, right, guys. That was fun. Yes, that was it was super a lot fun. of fun. That was super really talented informative. guy. Oh, I'm he's, telling you he's right phenomenal. Now. Are you kidding? He's amazing. Uh, unbelievable. Yeah. Singer and player. And I love the fact they've known him for so long. I and mean, he saw you when you when he was a yeah, teenager. Yeah, that's that's that was that I blows did my not mind, know actually. that. I did not know that. Yeah. So so interesting. So interesting. <laughs> anyway, thank you guys so much for joining us. Yeah. Uh, uh, next week, do we do we want to Give a little glimpse oh, of us. Uh, yes, next week. Yeah, next week. Roger Kane from the Pat Benatar Experience is going to be joining us. Yeah. That's always going to 
be a good time when you're uh, <laughs> sitting there with Roger trading stories about him and growing up with Superman, right? <laughs> Superman. Yeah. <laughs> Kane. So Roger Kane, who Roger is Roger Kane uh, from yeah. yeah the Pat Benatar experience. Yep. Yep. Okay, guys. Well, thanks. Uh, remember TLR Friday night Temecula and Led Zeppelin again TLR, Saturday night. Yeah, Led yep. Zeppelin again Saturday night in Temecula. If you're not in Temecula and you're in the South Bay, go and see um, TLR at the Gas Lamp in Long Beach. And if you're up in Santa Rosa. Well, no, we haven't got the purebred okay, right. on Sunday at 2 p.m. in the afternoon at the Coffee Gallery, yep. followed by Taylor Made Tapestry, Carla Buffa, and Stephen Bach as James Taylor and Carol King. Oh, Jim, you're it's in gonna like be a great. million bands. Yeah, it's going to be, oh, it's going to be fun. <sighs> All right. Uh, it's going to be a lot of fun. And then next Tuesday in Santa Rosa, we're going to be playing with, with Kenny, Kenny Metcalf. Metcalf. Yeah, yeah. It's going to be a blast. And doing um, a little wineries while we're at it. You're doing Playing, wineries. I'll be I don't, doing wineries I don't have to wine about. with the Metcalf clan. Yes. It's going to be fun. All yes. right. All right, okay, you guys. guys. Thank you thank so, you much, so for much for joining us. God we had such you. a good time. Uh, keep on thank rocking you, Ron. In the free world. Ron yes, from thanks to Ron Four, and We appreciate and it. We'll see uh, you with Roger Kane next week. Next Wednesday night. All right. Have a great night, guys. Bye, guys.